Marijuana is dangerous as far as I'm concerned. But I don't think there's anything more negative uh, about marijuana than there is about uh, alcohol, which is proven to be a man killer. I don't think that anybody should take any kind of drugs, especially since they're illegal. I think that it's just uh, going against your government to take them. It's a narcotic. In fact, I think there should be no laws against it at all. Frankly, I think they're a lot too lenient. Good evening. I'm Art Seidenbaum. Few issues divide generations as emotionally as the plant called marijuana. Increasing use by high school and college students in this country, by troops in Vietnam, set against the ignorance of parents about pot's pervasiveness, and complicated by the implications for many young people of marijuana possession being a felony. Relevant? The weed is already a symbol and, and a social symptom. Tonight, an extensive examination of symbol and symptom, starting with the world of the weed, a 20-minute historical perspective, then the current scene, a film tour through the world of marijuana today, and research report, THC, a look at scientific experimentation with the active chemical in marijuana. The second half of the program opens with family affair, teenage arrests seen through the eyes of those involved. And then the law, how effective is it? Hotly debated by a panel of experts. And last, an enlightening philosophical exploration entitled Personal Expectations. Along the way, we'll be visited by comedian Stan Freeberg the man who puts down highs and his repertory company. How did the common weed, marijuana, by one name or another, in one form or another, find its way among the indigent and the intelligent, the affluent and the apathetic, the worker in the field and the philosopher in his tower? Why has it generated so much praise and brought so much pain or punishment. Tonight's first program segment places the current use of marijuana in historical perspective.
all began, as did so many things long ago, steeped in the mythology of the land of the Middle Kingdom, China. There on the roof of the world, where jagged Himalayan peaks touched heaven itself, the gods produced a nectar that became their favorite drink. And in their unending compassion for the human race, they let some of the nectar fall to earth so that mankind could use it to attain delight, to lose all fear, and to release hidden desires. From this heavenly nectar grew a humble yet magical plant, a weed rising 10, 15, 20 feet toward the heavens and capable of taking man's very being with it. A curious plant, tall and sturdy, in the male variety, a stalk of strong cordage fibers destined to produce the material man would use to bind together his external world, hemp. In the female, clusters of delicate flowers in which lurked a resin, a nectar, destined to cut the tenuous ropes that bound together man's inner world. <laughs> In the China of the year 2737 BC, ruled Emperor Shen Nung, wise and practical, a keen observer of all matters of the spirit and the flesh. By contemplating the world about him, he saw the usefulness of nature's offerings. He developed the science of agriculture and wrote the first book on pharmacology, recommending that the flower tops of the female plants be dried and mixed in a form of an ointment or powder, to treat gout, rheumatism, malaria, absent-mindedness, and female weakness. Another effect of this unusual herb troubled Emperor Shenong. When the powder was sprinkled on food and eaten, it produced a strange form of happiness, euphoria, where the mind seemed to exist outside the body. He labeled the substance liberator of sin. The winds that lashed the mountains at the top of the world scattered the seeds, and by 1500 B.C., the liberator of sin found its way south to India. Here it became known as Indian hemp and was intertwined with religion, philosophy, and Hindu mysticism. Its cultivation became a science, its use epicurean, and its praises sung in the holy literature. For the liberator of sin was transformed into the soother of grief, the heavenly guide, the poor man's heaven. The flowers were brewed and consumed as a beverage called soma. Like wild winds, the droughts have raised me up. Have I been drinking soma? In my glory, I pass beyond the sky and the great earth. Have I been drinking soma? I will pick up the earth and put it here or put it there. Have I been drinking Soma? Soma again resembled nectar of the gods, celebrated in hymns and prayers, bringing inspiration, wisdom, and immortality. By 800 BC, only the resin from the flower clusters was used, coaxed out and prepared as a paste to be chewed as a food itself. This pure resin, many times more powerful than Soma, was called Charas. Trade routes replaced the winds as messengers of the heavenly guide, and by the 5th century BC, Indian hemp had reached the Middle East. There, peoples of Scythia and Thrace made clothing from the fibers, and the Scythians observed a strange funeral custom involving the plant. After the funeral, ritual purifications would begin. Hemp was thrown on heated stones and the smoke inhaled. Breathing the fumes, they would howl in joy, then exhausted, fall into a deep sleep. By the first century AD, the healing power of hemp was rediscovered by Dioscorides, who recommended a mixture of hemp seeds to soothe inflammation. 200 years later, a Chinese physician, Hua To, brewed a special wine from the plant, calling the mixture Mayao, hemp splendor. He used it successfully as an anesthetic. By the 5th century, use of hemp had reached most of the Middle East and Europe. Arab doctors prescribed hemp and hemp seeds for a variety of ailments, promising relief for the patient and new stature for this strange weed. 
But it was in the Muslim world during the time of the Crusades that hemp regained its evil reputation. Hassan ibn Saba, self-appointed executioner of false prophets and infidels, brought to his mountain fortress a group of young warriors, each of whom was assigned a man to murder. To entice the warriors and to inflame their passions for the deed, Hassan fed them a blackish yellow resin, the concentrated resin of the hemp flowers, the powerful Hindu drug Charas. From the name of Hassan, the group of murderers gained the name Assassin, to this day linked with hashish, the powerful drug they used. Now, the new world awaited. Before the conquest in 1509, hemp was already part of the religious rites and ceremonies of the Aztecs. No one knows how the plant was introduced into the Western Hemisphere. Montezuma's son was described as often taking a few puffs of a very pungent tobacco just after lunch. A deep sleep would follow. By the end of the 16th century, smoking of rolled hemp leaves was widespread throughout much of Central and South America. England set to the task of colonizing the New World with huge fleets, using sails woven of hemp and held together by rope fashioned from the same versatile weed. As England's commerce expanded, so did her demand for hemp. And so it was in the year 1611, near the new colony of Jamestown, that the first hemp to be grown in America was harvested. By 1630, a new use for hemp. Half the winter clothing and nearly all the summer clothes were made from it. But this plant was not new to the American Indian. French writer Jean Leander described the tribes and their medicine men. The priest burns dry leaves and, with a hollow stalk or a pipe, draws in the smoke and is transported to the point of losing all contact with his surroundings, as if in ecstasy, letting himself fall to the ground, completely relaxed and motionless. 1753, a new name was found for the Indian hemp plant, Cannabis sativa, a name carefully chosen, meaning cane-like plant, properly christened and respectfully included into that grand and orderly botanical scheme of things by Linnaeus, categorizer of the world's flora. In England and America, cannabis remained a commodity of industry, the second largest crop in the South, with many farmers planting it, as the diary of one Virginia planter reveals. May 12th, 1765. Sowed hemp at Muddy Hole by the swamp. August 7th, began to separate the male from the female hemp. Soon technology began to outstrip the usefulness of hemp. Steam doomed the sailing ship, and with it the huge sails woven of hemp. An introduction of the cotton gin in 1793 assured cheaper cotton clothing. The opening of the West in the 19th century gave brief renewal to the hemp industry through rising demand for rope and cloth for covered wagons. But hemp as a commercial product reached its peak by the Civil War. Meanwhile, another war, thousands of miles away, reawakened scientific interest in cannabis. Although cannabis already grew in most parts of Europe, French scientists accompanying Napoleon were intrigued by its widespread use in the Middle East. So beginning in the mid-19th century, hemp preparations were introduced into Western medicine, and experiments with the plant challenged both scientists and intellectuals for the rest of the century. It gives relief from pain and increases the appetite in all cases. And is effective in treating fatigue, rheumatism, rheumatic neuralgia. Cough, asthma, and delirium tremens. As a remedy for the relief of supraorbital neuralgia, no article affords better prospects than cannabis. For migraine, cannabis is probably the most satisfactory remedy. Not to be outdone by modern medicine men, intellectuals of Western Europe promptly organized to find new uses for cannabis. 1846, the Club de Hachachines is formed in Paris by Théophile Gautier, one of the first to write of the effects of cannabis in his celebrated work, Artificial Paradise, 
and Charles Baudelaire, who wrote of cannabis, One will not find anything admirable in the intoxication except one's own sharpened nature. Soon they ventured deeper into the unknown, turning to the more powerful form of cannabis, hashish. Concerned French officials clamped down, and for the first time in nearly 5,000 years, cannabis users were forced from the open streets into secret dens. Only the lofty intellectuals elsewhere still dared to experiment openly with their fantasies. Philosophers John Stuart Mill and Frederick Nietzsche, psychologist William James, authors Alexander Dumas and Rabelais. Towards the end of the 19th century, cannabis in one form or another, under one name or another, was almost universal, cutting across social and economic barriers. It was ground to powder and eaten or consumed as a beverage. It was burned in clay pipes and hookahs, in cigarettes and stone vessels. It was praised in song and hymn and damned in word and deed. It was used for religious purposes and medical purposes, to relax its user or to send him into acts of violence. Its users were the indolent and the industrious, the evil and the religious, the intellectual and the warrior. In England, as in France a few years earlier, voices of concern were raised over the practice of using cannabis as an intoxicant. In 1894, with the British Army in India, the Hemp Drugs Commission first organized study of the effects of cannabis. It produced a variety of opinions. Major Cobb, as a surgeon, would you say the habitual moderate use of any of these varieties of hemp produces any noxious effects, either physical, mental or moral? No. Mr. Chairman, my answer is yes. They weaken the constitution, produce loss of appetite, dysentery, asthma, bronchitis, impair the moral sense, induce laziness, habits of immorality, or debauchery. Evidence on these points is conflicting. It is the conclusion of this commission that in every instance the moderate use of hemp appears to cause no appreciable injury of any kind to the physical, mental, or moral well-being of the user. Excessive use, however, does cause injury. The 20th century. America's industrial expansion accelerated. Migrant workers from Mexico brought with them not only willing muscle, but also a bit of their own culture, little bags of mota, chopped cannabis plant, offering both gaiety and relaxation at the end of their labors. And it gave a new word to the American lexicon, marijuana, Mexican for Mary Jane. At last, Americans were to be confronted with an age-old custom and problem. <laughs> new Orleans, 1926. The original fun city, setting the pattern for styles, music, and gaiety in the roaring 20s. New Orleans, first American city to go on a binge, not from cheap bathtub gin or bootleg whiskey. For thousands of people, rich and poor, criminal and socialite, their high came from the weak. It was the roaringest of times. For commerce, it meant trade. But ships sailing up the Mississippi opened markets of a different kind. Markets for marijuana, now being called weed, pot and grass. Marijuana was reaching other American cities where it was rolled in paper called reefers or joints and smoked. By 1930, most major cities had at least a few smokers. Clumps of marijuana began growing as a weed in many parts of the Southwest. Demand and brisk trade developed with Havana, Tampico, and Veracruz. Marijuana became big business and big business became big news and sensation. A menace, that's what it is. Good Lord, don't you read the newspapers? I tell you, Sarah, they're selling it to little school children. I read where it... Softens the brain, makes them commit horrible crimes. If you ask me, there ought to be a law. The time was ripe. 
and the time was 1937. After testimony from agents of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, Congress passed the Marijuana Tax Act, the law designed to regulate the use of marijuana through federal police power. Its method, register users and sellers. Its technique, levy a nominal tax on those dealing in marijuana commercially, prescribing it professionally, or possessing it personally. Its penalties, failure to pay the tax of $1 per year brought five years in jail, $2,000 fine, or both. Its impact, felt by the marijuana users. As in France a century before, official restriction created a new class of outsiders, and doors were closed and locked throughout the country. At the further urging of Narcotics Commissioner Harry J. Anslinger, most other states passed laws prohibiting possession or sale of marijuana. But under the federal law, those importing, producing, selling, or giving it away still had to pay their tax. The combined effort of the legislation was to regulate commerce in a product when the product itself was illegal to possess or use in the first place. A year later, in 1938, out of the confusion and concern came a voice strong and clear, Fiorello LaGuardia, mayor of New York. When rumors circulated that marijuana was being smoked by large segments of the population and even by school children, he conferred with the New York Academy of Medicine and appointed a team of 31 leading physicians, psychiatrists, and sociologists. Their job, make a painstaking two-part scientific study. First, the social aspects. Who uses marijuana and why? How widespread is it? And what is the relationship between its use and crime? Second, determine the physiological and psychological effects on different types of persons, by means of carefully controlled experiments. By 1944, the report was released, and its findings, rather than resolving controversy, stirred it anew. Among users, aggressiveness and belligerency were not commonly seen. There is no direct relationship between commission of crimes of violence and marijuana. Its use can be stopped abruptly with no resulting mental or physical distress. It does not change the basic personality structure. It lessens inhibitions and brings out what is latent in the user's thoughts and emotions. Summing up the study, its chairman concluded that marijuana was not a drug of addiction. Further, those who had been smoking marijuana for a period of years showed no mental or physical deterioration which may be attributed to the drug. The lessening of inhibitions and repression, the euphoric state, the feeling of adequacy, the freer expression of thoughts and ideas and the increase of appetite for food brought about by marijuana all suggested therapeutic possibilities. But the American Medical Association did not agree. It launched an attack on the LaGuardia report, criticizing both its findings and the scientific techniques used to obtain them. 1956, the Federal Narcotics Control Act strengthened the penalties of the Marijuana Tax Act. Prison sentences for possession or distribution were raised to 10, 20, and 40 years. The battle between those who saw marijuana as an evil menace and those who saw it as a harmless nuisance gathered adherents on both sides. 1962, the ad hoc panel on drug abuse at the White House conference tended to support the LaGuardia Committee findings. Although marijuana has long held the reputation of inciting individuals to commit sexual offenses and other antisocial acts, evidence is inadequate to substantiate this. Marijuana has been part of the world scene for thousands of years, and cannabis has been used by millions of people. It is in the international arena where the debate has escalated and where ultimate resolution of the dilemma may come. 1966 the single convention treaty on narcotic drugs was adopted by the UN. Although it does not condone use of marijuana, it does recognize its worldwide popularity and the fact that eradication will not be easy or quick. The treaty calls for the use of cannabis for other than medical and scientific purposes to be discontinued as soon as possible, but in any case within 25 years. While not binding on member nations or supplanting their national laws, the treaty hopes to end in a quarter of a century, a practice that has endured for over 50 centuries.
Cannabis sativa, a common weed, planted and nurtured in mythology 5,000 years ago, and today still surrounded by myth, hidden by widespread underground use, and in the center of a continuing and growing controversy. But myth can be shattered by precise knowledge. Use can be understood when examined reasonably. Controversy can be resolved by dispassionate investigation. And all the while, as men argue heatedly and experiment carefully and smoke furtively, perhaps somewhere the gods are pondering the propriety of their gift of nectar. And man himself is asking, what hath the gods wrought? Here in our studio, to shed a bit more light on the marijuana problem and the communications gap behind it, is that controversial communications expert and wizard of the electronic age, Mr. Marshall McMedium. How do you do? Mr. McMedium, you claim that the message is the medium, and the medium is the message? Yes, and vice versa. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yes, well, we're certainly glad to have you as a guest in our studio. I'm not a guest in the studio. I am the studio. The guest is the studio, the studio is the guest. Well, there's a lot of truth in that. You bet. How do you describe yourself, Mr. McMedium? A teacher, a thinker, a philosopher? Well, I, I don't care for any of those labels. Oracle? Oracle I like. All right. I like that. Uh, Mr. Yeah. McMedium, uh, why is it in your opinion that people who uh, turn on with marijuana have to be cool about it? Well, uh, uh, simply because... Uh, Marijuana is ba basically a cool narcotic, whereas bananas are a hot narcotic. I don't follow that. You don't follow that? No. Well, uh, <laughs> this is plain as the nose on my face. Uh, or to put it more succinctly, uh, my nose is my face, my face is my nose. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Yes, but you, you said marijuana is a cool narcotic. I isn't it ever hot? Uh, only when you're caught with it. I see. Well, now, you have said in your brilliant analytical academic textbook, Understanding Pot, uh, that communications is turning into a three-way street. Did I say that? Uh, yes. You, you have a nice way with words. Uh, right. Yes, but would you, you wouldn't mind explaining that, would you? I certainly would. This constant explaining of my explanations is turning into a pain in the neck, believe me. Well, uh, My neck is the pain, the pain... Uh, yes, but you, uh, what uh, did you really mean when you said that communications was turning into a uh, three-way street? Well, uh, <clears throat> I, I simply meant that... Uh, <clears throat> Can I have the question again, please? Uh, uh, the uh, three-way street. Oh, well, uh, uh, in reference to the, to the uh, marijuana problem, uh, the children are uh, putting, doing their own fill-in uh, there. It's, uh, it's just a three-way. Uh, the kids are determined to turn on. The parents uh, wish to turn them off, while the police uh, are determined to uh, t uh, turn them in. Yes, well, that sheds a lot of light on the situation. Well, I, I certainly hope that uh, clears, clears the matter up uh, yes, once but, uh, and for all. Yes, but now you've, uh, uh, you've stated the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the problem. Mm -hmm. Could you give us a solution? Oh, no, no. Oracles don't solve anything. They just, they just point out the problems that exist. I'm, I'm just here to articulate the electronic age and to hold a mirror up to the various transistorized components uh, inherent in the system uh, mass media-wise. You know, it, it uh, certainly is wonderful to sit here and talk like this. Yes, you know, only on an educational station could a conversation like this take place. Yes. Uh, could you leave us with a final bit of McMedium philosophy? Well, uh, there's a certain technological implosion at work in our culture here. The world has become a vast electronic extension, I'm sorry, extension of man, which programs us far beyond the periphery of our previous fragmentized environment in a pseudo-hallucinogenic expansion of the mind. Follow me? Uh, yeah, you yes. You do follow that? Uh, yes. Well, then, would you do me a favor? What's that? Would you mind explaining to me what I just said? As the oppressed ad agencies say, Freeberg now. But let's instead go for a fast moving look into the world of the marijuana user today. Who is he? What does he say about himself? Where does he get it and how does he get it? 
Here then, the current scene. You go into a movie one night and you smoke grass the next night. It's just, you yeah, know, it's just getting high, it's just having fun. Just a form of relaxation. And it is a kick, it's a definite kick. You really do feel quite different. Your ears buds, your hands and your body sort of tingles. On grass, time is kind of chopped up. It helps you to synthesize a lot of things and put things in their proper perspective. You know? Sometimes it's like a, um, one of those old-time movies. The pictures go flashing. It makes you come to some decisions as to what is important for you to do and what isn't. It's very personal. When you're, when you're passing it, it, uh, it just brings everybody in a closer tie. It's really not a party at all. It's not like a drinking party or anything when people don't know each other and people just running around. It's, uh, you know, you're really relating to each other. And I find that a lot of people, it seems, want to get together with other people. And today, it's, it's hard just to say, well, come on, let's do something together. So some people tend to say, well, why don't we, you know, get stoned and go somewhere. And so this sort of brings people together, and it's, it's nice. Yeah. And I think if somebody walked in to a pot party after everyone had already smoked the grass and it was all put away, I don't think anyone would notice any difference. There would be music and it would be loud, but nobody would be dancing. They would just be sitting around and talking. Nothing out of the ordinary at all. In 1967, the LAPD arrested 10,479 people as compared to 7,559 people in 1966 for various drug offenses. This tremendous increase was due largely to the increase of marijuana violations. In 1967, the LAPD seized 5,533 pounds of marijuana as compared to 2,294 pounds in 1966. Marijuana attacks the spiritual and mental aspects of the user. It removes inhibitions and in many cases leads to antisocial and sometimes criminal behavior. We have many cases documented in which marijuana has been a part and parcel of other criminal behavior. Well, you know, it's, it's just part of the lifestyle of black people, you know. It's like, uh, you know, it's part of your weekend. I mean, if there's nothing happening on the weekend, you know, then that means there's no trip. There's nothing to do. It's like the uh, antithesis of what the white dudes do, you know, go off in a corner and hide, make it something exotic, something for a clique, a certain group of people. You know, man, well, everybody gets high. You know, like last week, I saw a whole family of black people getting high, man, and it was such a natural thing, you know. Everybody walked around and somebody says, well, let me, you know, would you light my joint? Well, I said, well, yeah, of course, you know, I would. I wouldn't do anybody that cold by not lighting their joint, you know. When the Chicano or uh, the Mexican-American, as uh, people know, is uh, blast off, it's, just, it's, not a, it's not really a big thing. I mean, it's not something that we look forward to, I mean, uh, with great anxiety, because it's a common thing. It happens every day, every, every week. I mean, it's nothing, I mean, that, that, that you go, wow, about. It's a great feeling, but it's something that's with us. It's something that we accept as part of, our, of, as part of a culture, like uh, you get back into culture and... Uh, you go back into folk songs in Mexico. Uh, well, take the Mexican Revolution, for example. Uh, La Cucaracha, well, what does it say? La Cucaracha, La Cucaracha. She doesn't want to walk no more. Why? I mean, because she has no marijuana to smoke, and the song says it. I mean, it's, uh, it's there. <laughs> There's been a definite change in the kind of people who use marijuana. Used to be, as everybody knows, I think, uh, people from the lowest socioeconomic levels and occasional subgroups, musicians and others who used it. Nowadays, it's become a, a practice for people of the middle class and the advantaged classes, professionals, particularly students, college, high school, even elementary students. The expectations uh, of people using marijuana vary greatly. Uh, I think one of the characteristic things that I've heard repeatedly from people who have never used it before and have no clear expectation of what it's going to do is that they don't have any particular reaction to it. 
Uh, this may be a function of the dose that they get. It may also be uh, an indication that what one gets from the drug is tremendously determined by what one's psychological expectations will be to a much greater degree than uh, the reaction is determined by the pharmacological or chemical properties of the drug itself. Well, I get picked up every day by 30 and 40 year old people who smoke marijuana. It's not just the kids. So I'd say there's, I'd say one third of the people in LA smoke marijuana. I really don't know. I don't know anything about marijuana. I never tried marijuana, so I wouldn't have any opinion on it at all. If you would please park your car in the inspection area, straight ahead. Uh, what's the problem? Well, you are uh, entering the United States from Mexico, sir, and each vehicle is subject to search when entering the United States from a foreign country. I don't believe our vigilance has increased particularly. There's just absolutely more of it being smuggled. We find it under the fenders. We find uh, specially built secret compartments and uh, automobiles. And uh, we find uh, false truck bottoms. Frankly, any place that uh, an imaginative person can think of that won't be found, why, that's likely to be where it is. We have approximately 1,500 pounds in this load. It was seized and apprehended at a, as uh, they were attempting to bring it across the border. There's probably 35 different seizures involved in this load. Section uh, 176A of Title 21, the United States Code, calls for uh, a five-year prison sentence upon conviction for uh, smuggling marijuana. Right, let me see one of the boxes, will you fellas, please? Generally comes packed in cellophane packages weighing approximately one kilo. It does uh, hide the odor. It helps conceal the odor, which of course, when a person is trying to hide it in an automobile, he doesn't, uh, doesn't want it advertised that he's bringing it with him. I imagine it's uh, ready to be rolled up and smoked, I suppose. cultivation of the marijuana, the processing of the marijuana into kilo packages, the transportation, the smuggling of the marijuana across the international boundary, all this is part of an organized criminal organization. The single fact that uh, in 1966 uh, over a thousand kilograms of marijuana were seized by our bureau alone in the state of California and uh, in 1967, over 3,500 kilos were seized, uh, clearly demonstrates uh, uh, the effectiveness of uh, law enforcement in this area. However, in spite of this effort, there is a continuous flow of marijuana into the state of California by this organized criminal organization. This is a marigold field growing in L.A. Marijuana is as easy to grow as marigold. Marijuana needs very little care to grow. It needs water and a little sunshine. Planted in February, you usually have a good crop by early summer. The female plant is the plant that is used. It has pods of seeds. It's got very strange shaped leaves, uh, dark green in color usually. They're not hard to spot once you know what one looks like. This is a kilo. Uh, uh, you have to cut it down before you start to clean it because it explodes. A small portion of it turns into very large and uh, messy. I generally cut it in half and then possibly a quarter. This way it's much uh, cleaner to give the uh, uh, a whole compressed half if you're selling it or if you're giving it to someone. Or... It's not as large as uh, most kilos, but uh, it's very clean. It's very moist. The stems are not very large. They're not any, there's not a large clump of branches. There are no rocks. Uh, as you can see, it, it comes out into a very large quantity.
just put it in the box here, so uh, clean the seeds out. Most of the seeds get the bulk of them out. The scooping action, the seeds will just roll down. The flower of the plant, the leaves, are the part that uh, are usually have the best quality, the best uh, <laughs> stone. So uh, put them through a strainer just to separate, leaves the branches in the strainer. And they use a very easy rolling product at the bottom. You don't want to have the seeds because they'll, they pop and they, they tend sometimes to uh, give a person a headache. These, it's separating the leaves here from the stems. These, uh, when you roll, uh, these stems sometimes break the paper and you can use the stems later in a pipe uh, where they'll burn more evenly. It's generally just getting, getting the waste out is what it's doing. Just the ends that keeps the loose, keeps it from uh, falling out the end. Actually, uh, sometimes when the when you have it loose, when you roll it loose, you can shake it like this. This packs it and makes it a little much more even. Roach is, uh, when you get down about this far, it gets uh, under the small end. You generally need a holder to uh, smoke the rest of it. Here's some tweezers. This can be done by just holding an end of it. This way you won't burn your fingers and you won't, uh, you tend not to burn your lips. I'm Luana Cormier, National Director of the Family Panel of America. In this position, I have the opportunity of speaking to from 500 to 1,000 homemakers each month here in the Southern California area. Now, many of these ladies tell me that their sons and daughters tell them that they have friends in school, in the restrooms, and in the libraries using marijuana cigarettes. My own youngsters have told me that they have gone to mixed parties where marijuana is smoked by most of the children. And, and this, this really frightens me. We had a health class, and in our book, we were taught it leads to heroin, usually. And we had a movie on it about these teenagers <laughs> who tried it and then had tried pills and went off and got pregnant and ran over cliffs and <laughs> ended up in Synanon or whatever. <laughs> and I think they, what they tell you is what most of the adults believe now and why it's really generally considered so bad, they just, I guess, don't know all the facts. There's a cocktail that I make up, just one easy way to use, smoke a roach. You can uh, pour it into the top end of a cigarette, and then uh, when you go in some place where it's not cool to be holding, you can just uh, pull it out, smoke it. By the time anybody realizes, or if anybody realizes what's going on, it's gone. Smoking it through a water pipe cools the smoke because the, the smoke has to rise through the water and before it gets to your uh, mouth. You tend to get more smoke in per draw, but you also use more, you also lose more uh, during the, uh, while you're smoking it. It's just a, a different way of smoking it. If I, I, if I knew of an eight-year-old girl who turned on, I just, that's the kind of kid you just deserve an immediate slapping and a no, 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 don't touch that. And really strict uh, disciplinary me uh, measures and then have a long hard look at the parents because if a, an eight or nine year old is getting pot that's bad and I, if you start at eight or nine years old you will eventually wind up on the really hard stuff you just you can't avoid it because the kick will become a part of you as a child pot has gotten to be the uh, underground thing that, that uh, smoking used to be for the younger people but now you're eight and you score a number and that's that's a big thing now
and you find that when kids turn on, there is as much fun in lighting the joint and in passing it around and in hoping that mommy and daddy don't come home and bust in on you while the, the smoke forbidden is fruit. the forbidden fruit, while they don't, you know, they, what's that smoke? Oh, it's just uh, some incense I got, Ma, uh, that it's, the, it's a game. <laughs> uh, if I caught my sons uh, smoking marijuana, uh, I would reprimand them because I feel that this is uh, wrong in the eyes of society and wrong in my eyes and wrong in my parents' eyes, I think it hurts a person morally. It exposes them to other things that could be detrimental to the mind and body. Hmm. Well, I wouldn't be very happy about it, about my daughter smoking marijuana, whether it was done on the sly or done in my presence. I think it would require a psychological research of what causes her to seek some thrill. Because marijuana, I think for teenagers, is uh, it's a forbidden fruit. If my son is smoking marijuana, uh, number one, I don't want it, but if he is, I much prefer that he's going to do it in front of his mother and myself, sitting in our own home. Nothing's going to happen to him by the smoking of the marijuana cigarette. Now, I'm more concerned about who he is with when he's not with me. The type of individuals that he associates with, I think, is far more important. All addicts that I know smoked marijuana prior to becoming addicts. I'm not saying that everyone that smoked marijuana would become an addict. I know that myself, I smoked marijuana for many years before I became an addict. I'm one of the few or one of the many of all addicts that makes that big promise to themselves that I'll never become a dope. I'll never become a dope fiend. I'll never use anything in any, 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 any heavier. Kids seem to think today that their problem is so much different than ours was, but I don't think it is. I think that it's just a revolution this time on this marijuana rather than other uh, things that we did when we were very small. <laughs> Mind-bending, stash, ripped, stony, heavy, scarf, boss, boxed, Samson, spaced out. Pot. Keith. Keith. Cut. Cut. Hashish. Hashish, boo, goo, Indian hay, muta, stick, pahang, rock, ganja, charas, marijuana, Mary Jane, Juanita, niña, Rosa Maria, sonatora, charge, canopia, canopia, canopia. <laughs> Alcohol is a high caloric substance that contains seven calories per cc and serves as a food substitute. The individual that's regularly intoxicated with alcohol doesn't eat and as a result of these nutritional side effects develops cirrhosis of the liver, peripheral neuritis, organic brain damage. Marijuana conversely lowers blood sugar, stimulates appetite, and the individual that regularly uses marijuana eats more than an individual that doesn't. Uh, this is holds true with both human beings and animals, in which animals, given marijuana, gain weight at, at a rate greater than control. As a result, we don't see a chronic or organicity with marijuana use that we see with alcohol. We don't see cirrhosis of the liver, peripheral neuritis, organic brain damage with marijuana as it's used in our culture. We have, however, seen a, a motivational syndrome. That is, certain young people that regularly smoke marijuana tend to undergo a fragmentation of their personality, a deterioration of their psychological drives, and the treatment has been to persuade these individuals to stop smoking marijuana, similar to an alcoholic. You persuade him to abstain entirely from alcohol, and problems tend to clear. With marijuana, when I got them to smoke, stop smoking marijuana, uh, the structures of their personality came back and there were no further problems. Why add marijuana drunk drivers to our alcoholic drunk driving problem? Why add a potential five to eight and a half million marijuaniacs to our five to eight and a half million alcoholics and thereby aggravate our most serious social problem? Man, everybody's turning on. I just read this magazine article. It was by John Steinbeck's son who was in Vietnam in the Army. He said that U.S. soldiers, do some fantastic figure, like 75%, they smoke grass all the time. I was in Vietnam as a 
correspondent for a little over two years. During that time, I did see the use of marijuana increase. As far as young Mr. Steinbeck's allegation that 75% of the GIs are using it, I, I definitely feel that's an exaggeration. GIs are naturally lonely. They're away from their loved ones, and uh, in many cases, their jobs are monotonous, lasting 12 months with more or less the same repetition, and uh, quite often, uh, they turn to pot out of necessity. It's also quite evident that since pot is such a big thing in this country, that naturally the GIs over there are going to want to copy what their friends at home are doing. I remember reading in a recent magazine article that the uh, whole uh, cigarette paper business has been revivified over the last few years. Sales are way up. And uh, of course, that's only a part of it. They make all kinds of flavors and colors and uh, almost anything else you can think of. This is a typical L.A. psychedelic head shop. These are some roach holders that uh, I've found in a lot of the shops. Uh, you can make your own. They, they, they're not very expensive. Uh, you can get fancy ones, uh, whatever. Water pipes can be found just about everywhere. Uh, I was just walking through this uh, market and uh, in a small curio shop. That has nothing to do, no psychedelic uh, undertones or anything, uh, but there were water pipes just sitting in the corner. They're selling everywhere. I think the most important consideration is the moral consideration. And that being whether a person has the right to do what he wants to do with himself as, against, as opposed to what society wants him to do. Society today, for the young person, or for anybody really, if you take a good hard look at it, is very ugly. You've got a war in Vietnam, you've got riots in the streets, you've got mom and dad having a really big hassle at home every night behind closed doors or in front of you. And it's, it's good to leave reality. Pot does that for you. The enforcement of marijuana laws is primarily uh, an aspect of protecting the health and safety of the people of the state of California. I favor the abolition of marijuana laws. I feel that in this area, a person should be able to think for themselves and decide whether they wish to smoke marijuana or not. Much like smoking of cigarettes or the intake of alcohol, overeating, or perhaps picking your nose. I don't think a person should go to jail for it, much less I don't think it should be a felony. There are no victims in the area. It's not like burglary, it's not like robbery, it's not like murder. A person should choose for themselves. I think society's attitude is too harsh. Every time I think that I'm the only one who's only someone calls on me. And every now and then I spend my time and time and person for so small silly. And then I'm Why do they call it acid rock? Because the people that make it and the people that hear it and the people that perform it and the people that dance to it are all involved in, in the psychedelic scene. That includes marijuana. Not just LSD, it's marijuana too. Yeah. It's hard to say marijuana rock. Tandon, you wrote a, a song called The Long Comes Mary. And uh, the words were a little difficult to understand for the most part, but the people who read the words all felt that, at least people I talked to, that it was about marijuana, that Mary meant marijuana. Is that true? Yes. Well, why did you write a song about marijuana? Well, because um, ever since I began writing songs, uh, Mary helped me. At that time, I was drawing my inspiration from different girls I was meeting. and. Uh, I decided, uh, why not write a song to, to one who'd been there all the time, every time I wrote a song. And so I decided to write one to Mary. And then along comes Mary. The law enforcement officer really sees the marijuana user in his natural habitat. He sees the marijuana user when he is high on the drug, when he is 
uh, belligerent and, and aggressive and resists arrest, has the feeling of omnipotence, uh, the feeling that he can't be taken by anyone, that he uh, uh, is uh, God himself, uh, the feeling of, uh, of persecution that he uh, exhibits, uh, and so forth. I think it is imperative for us to recognize that all the clinical data that we have available to us not only from psychiatrists and psychoanalysts, but from social workers and psychologists and from other observers of the social scene, that it is clear cut and absolutely clearly demonstrable that marijuana inhibits aggression and violence in all its manifestations. In fact, that is one of the riddles that makes us scientists wonder what does this particular drug do to obliterate or inhibit what we consider to be a human instinct? In this violence-ridden, brutal world that we live, I think it is of imperative importance that we have the opportunity to do research upon a drug which apparently does block, stop, limit hostile, aggressive, violent behavior of man to man. I think it should be studied carefully and in very controlled circumstances. I think such a project would be of great value to medicine, psychiatry, and the human condition. And then along comes Mary Out of that noise and dark confusion, and now possibly a few shreds of light from philosopher Alan Watts. There is no law against my possession of this exceedingly dangerous samurai sword from my collection. The only possible way in which I can get into trouble with the law through possessing this instrument is if I misuse it. And therein lies a fundamental legal principle. But although it may be very reasonable to prevent people from private possession of atom bombs or machine guns, things of this kind may be possessed so long as we don't hurt others. And I think the same principle applies very cogently to the possession of marijuana or other drugs that may be dangerous when used in uh, certain ways. But a law against possession of almost any substance, especially a natural substance, possession as such is profoundly demoralizing. Furthermore, it's against the Judeo-Christian religious tradition upon which our laws are still to a large extent based, because every Christian and every Jew would assent to the idea in the book of Genesis that all natural substances created by God are intrinsically good and that evil can only ensue from their misuse. The difficulty is then that laws against the possession of such things as marijuana or other psychedelic drugs invite disrespect of law itself and contempt of the police because they can so easily be used for purposes of bribery, entrapment and conspiracy. If, for example, you have a political or business rival that you want to get rid of, nothing would be easier than to drop a few grains of marijuana into his pocket or somewhere around his house, tip off the police, and there he is, convicted of a felony. So any way that, uh, as people begin to realize the danger of these sort of laws, and therefore, for that very reason, misapply them, can bring our police into great contempt, and uh, the whole campaign against this kind of thing is uh, wasting their valuable time because our police are needed for much more serious matters. Now I, as a psychologist of religion, I'm interested in this matter because I'm interested in all things that change people's consciousness, especially if they change them in the direction in which religion has in the past changed people's consciousness. And because laws against these things exist, I, as a scholar in this field, am prevented from doing research in it. 
What the kids seem to be looking for, at least the kids I've met, is really at bottom themselves. And very few of us adults can do very much for them unless we develop a kind of philosophy of our own about coping with reality, about forgetting about the numbers and variety of pills in the medicine chest, about forgetting the number of cocktails required to get us out of a working day, about the kind of hypocrisy that we really know is all too real. If there were a kind of exemplary adult walking around this world, maybe there would be a kind of reason for kids to forget about drugs, to find within reality something that made a certain amount of sense to them, something that made them feel that this world was worth saving and not running away from. It's a very complicated problem, much more profound in its own way than the legal aspects of the use of marijuana, much more worrisome than the admonitions from policemen, lawyers, counselors, teachers, even ministers. I think it's we who've probably failed them. And out of that failure comes our own incredible frustration. Because what do we do with a whole generation of kids who have looked at us and found us not very exemplary at all, not very content to live in the reality we've made, not very sure of where we're going, much less where they may be going when and if they all grow up. We return to potpourri and back to the experts. Perhaps the nittiest problem in the gritty dispute over the effects of marijuana is the lack of current research. Under the sponsorship of the National Institute for Mental Health, fresh investigation is now being done at Stanford University. For a look at such research in process, meet Dr. Leo Hollister, Assistant Chief of Staff at the Palo Alto Veterans Hospital, and correspondent Tom Pettit, plus a most agreeable subject. To avoid any mundane anticlimax, this report will be followed by a special visitor from the moon, Freeberg, the man in the moon. Would you be interested in taking part in a study like this again and having oh. the same type of drug? Sure. You would. It's been Any. a very pleasant experience for you. I'll do it any time you want. Do you think it would be... Any time at all. Do you think Just it would be... Just call a... me any time of the day or night. The plain fact is that uh, uh, none of us know very much about this drug in any uh, uh, verifiable way. And I think that uh, the studies that are beginning to open up now that uh, interest has been aroused in the uh, drug and, and this pure material is available will do a lot to uh, uh, settle the dispute as to how safe or how dangerous the drug may be. This is Veterans Hospital in Palo Alto, California, where Dr. Leo Hollister is engaged in one of America's few scientific studies of marijuana and its effect on human beings. One volunteer subject is Bill Mahler, 23, unmarried, a graduate student at Stanford. The drug is called tetrahydrocannabinol, THC for short. THC is the active chemical in marijuana. It was isolated for the first time just last year. These are among the first experiments on human beings with the pure substance. THC is not readily available or easy to produce. Dr. Hollister's limited supply comes from the National Institutes of Mental Health, which finances his research. The dose is the equivalent of about three marijuana cigarettes. Well, Bill, we're ready to go. Uh, this is the dose of today's drug. There have been virtually no scientifically controlled experiments like this for nearly 30 years. Now, with the newly isolated chemical, Dr. Hollister hopes to define more precisely what marijuana does. You probably notice it has a uh, mildly alcoholic flavor. That's something we can't avoid because the drug has to be dissolved in uh, alcohol. There's been a great deal of uh, experience with marijuana in the past because this drug has been used for 
uh, several thousand years by hundreds of millions of people. Uh, there has been some research done with it as well. But most of this is fairly uh, old. That is, uh, um, if you look in the literature, most of it was done up until about the middle 1940s, and then uh, there's a great uh, gap. Uh, since that time, the uh, problem, of course, has become much greater uh, in terms of uh, the social use of the drug in this country. And uh, it's also now possible to do this in a systematic fashion by uh, taking advantage of the availability of the uh, pure substance. Bill, how do you feel now? Uh, really great. Do you really? Yeah. Is it a nice sensation? Yeah, it's beautiful. Is it really? So weird patterns and stuff. You know, when Does I close your mind my eyes. keep wandering? No, it doesn't wander. Uh, well, I was getting so hot in here with these lights, you know? Yeah. So I just started thinking that I was cold. And now I'm cold. Now you're cold. Yeah. Like I imagined I was walking through snow. And, and the rest of my body was all hot because I had all kinds of heavy clothes on but my feet were cold because I didn't have any boots on. And then the, gradually, you know, I started getting colder on my legs and it just kind of moved up my body until finally I was cold. We want to have an idea of how you feel now as compared to the way you felt before you had the drug. Uh, happy. Uh, Shaky. Uh, As opposed to steady. Do you right. think you feel more shaky than you do steady? Yeah. Yes, you do. Okay. Yeah, I, I feel like I'm kind of bouncing up and down on the bed, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't know if I am or that, really, but it feels that way. A respiratory machine designed especially for these experiments is so sensitive that it can measure the effect of two cups of coffee. Now, if you'll just put this in between your right. teeth and your lips. The machine can determine whether a drug stimulates or depresses the human respiratory system. In short, does the drug in marijuana cause faster breathing and intake of more air? The test was given to Bill Mahler every hour. To measure the psychological effects, he was given a series of cards and told to pick out a description of his own feelings. You know, I could take a goose up there, but... Uh, the effect right of the now, drug was increasing. Daring. Daring. Place. 
they are synonyms. Ah. She say something ridiculous. It is possible that it could be a safe drug if used in moderation, such as uh, many millions of people in this country believe uh, it can be done with alcohol, or that it can be a dangerous and crippling drug, as uh, several million alcoholics in this country know. Uh, these uh, factors need to be explored to determine whether or not it truly is uh, uh, safe, or, and if so, in what uh, manner of use. Uh, the analogy is often made that it's no more dangerous than uh, alcohol, but that's uh, damning with rather faint praise, because uh, anyone familiar with the use of alcohol knows that this can be an extraordinarily you know, dangerous drug. Come on, let's go now. At regular intervals, as his intoxication increased, lab technicians took blood samples to measure the amount of the drug in Bill Mahler's system and what it does to the blood itself. Everything just gets, you know, popping around. You know, everything's just moving, constantly moving. It's just like, you know, going down to a light show or something. Everything's just bouncing around. And, you know. Well, Bill, it's been about two hours since you got the drug. How do you feel? <laughs> oh, it's, it's hard to explain, you know, because there's... Nothing like it in the real world, you know. I mean, it's just, this completely different, you know. So it's, I really can't compare it to anything. It's not like anything you've experienced before? Oh, uh, never, never in this amount, you know. Uh -huh. Is it similar, but two, but greater than the effects you got from marijuana? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You look sort of bemused, as if you're smiling and happy. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's right. And a little bit, uh, your eyes seem red to me. Can we take off your glasses okay. and take a look at these eyes? Uh, yeah, they're a little bit bloodshot. Almost as if you've uh, been drinking a bit too much. But you, you, this does not feel the same as alcoholic intoxication. No, no. With alcohol, you know, you have a, an initial build-up phase, and then it kind of tapers off, and, and you get kind of sick. And maybe it just prolongs that. Uh, you did it on the other arm last time. Doesn't really make much difference. Oh, We're well. going to assume the blood is going <laughs> with equal force in both. I don't be too sure about that. <laughs> Well, do you have any doubts about that issue? Well, I think, you know, if I didn't want it to, you know, it wouldn't. Bill, I wonder if you could fill out this subjective effects list, just as you did before. Yeah. And here you are. And tell me if you feel more alert than you do sleepy, or if you feel the way you did before you had the drug. In continued psychological testing, his background as a student of mathematical psychology influenced his answers. Last two times I put it there, and, uh... Okay, I feel... About the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A little bit. Yeah. Alert. A little bit, you know, more to the extremes, but the mean is, you know, right the same spot. Mm -hmm. you, know, you get yeah, that you bimodal can... distribution. 
probably don't I understand see. that. Do you think you feel uh, more you're a mathematical than you psychologist? Oh, <laughs> definitely, yes. Okay, do you think you feel very happy? Uh, or only moderately so? No, very happy, you know. All I'm right. Really Whee! Elated, yes. Very that's, elated, yes, huh? That's right up there with happy. Shaky, shaky. As opposed to steady. Do you yeah. feel more shaky when um, you do steady? Let's see, I forget where I put the last time I think I put it there, so I'm a little more, a little, little more, more shaky. Yeah, a little, a little bit more, you know. But uh, sociable, oh, definitely, yes. Very, very, very social. Mm -hmm. Anxious, anxious, no. You feel more relaxed. It's, you know, it's not one or the other. I mean, those two aren't necessarily at the extremes of a continuum, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can feel anxious, and the opposite of feeling anxious would be, um... Not relaxed? You, uh, you'd, you know, it's not actually relaxing. Uh, it's kind of relaxing, but with the possibility of, of concentrating, you know, just, you know, Boom, like that, you've got it. You know, you can you can control it. You know, like um, Zen masters can can kind of do this kind of thing. Uh, it's I don't know if you're familiar with that kind of stuff. Well, maybe I don't know, but well, it's all kinds well, of perhaps, stuff with electrons, and all that kind of stuff. Yes. Well, perhaps you can uh, decide whether you feel more relaxed than you do You still want to impose these artificial labels mm -hmm. and that's ridiculous. Labels, you know, should, you know forget them, you know. Mm -hmm. Just, they're all artificial, you know. So it is, you know, feel that you I have can't label my feeling right. either anxious right. Or relax. Those are not All right. opposite well, let's leave that continuum. One. Let's, why don't we go on to the next one and, and tell me if you feel I could, cheerful. I could say, it would, we could say that if it's neither one or the other, then I could, you know, okay. define right. this you as, define this as, as feeling as being a zero. Right in the middle. Fine. Okay. All right. All right. We'll define it that way. Okay. All right. <laughs> Gotta get those postulates down, man, you know. <laughs> we found out that the drug makes people happy. It makes them intoxicated and finally makes them sleepy, which is about what marijuana users were telling us happened all the time. Uh, we found that it is a mild respiratory stimulant, which could possibly be a use for it if this property can be disassociated from its uh, other uh, effects. It lowers blood pressure, which again offers a possible therapeutic use. It stimulates appetite, and we know that uh, this is not at the moment due to a change in blood sugar, but we don't have an explanation for uh, this effect. Uh, we know that it, it impairs performance. This latter is evident in the psychometric test that we do, where there is a falling off of performance, either in the number of tasks that are completed or in uh, the accuracy of them. In the performance test, Bill Mahler was able to maintain accuracy, but at the price of completing fewer problems. His concept of time had been impaired. The respiration test disclosed for the first time that the drug in marijuana acts to stimulate breathing. But the tests of muscle strength indicated a measurable weakening effect. Relax slowly. The Relax subject may feel stronger, slowly. but in fact he is weaker. All right. Good. Electrocardiograph measurement showed no significant change in heartbeat. But the drug in marijuana does lower blood pressure, which could suggest potential therapeutic use. Sophisticated measurement of effects on blood itself is only starting. So far, there have been no conclusive findings on retention of the drug, development of tolerance levels, 
or their relationship to psychological addiction. At this point, no one knows for sure what continued use of marijuana does to the people who use it, except to get very high and very thirsty, but with no hangover. This is Bill Mahler at the peak of intoxication. Later, he said the experience was both pleasurable and exciting, but after the euphoria had worn off, he also recalled an intense feeling of detachment. I felt like I was, you know, like I knew what was going on. And uh, most of it seemed kind of funny in a way. Uh, like I was seeing it, and yet I was not really there. I was kind of removed from it and viewing myself and the people around me from an outside position. And from that position, what was going on seemed somehow kind of ridiculous, you know. But at the time, what seemed ridiculous to Bill also felt sublime. It's beautiful, man. It's just beautiful. You know? But I, I can't show it to you, you know, because I'm not that kind of a person, you know. So I'm a real extrovert, you know, to, to be in an experiment for the TV camera, you know. You know, if you're going to go with the jeans over there, I don't go like a sexy, baby. You know. <laughs> what a goddamn nurse. <sighs> Did you get that? None of us know very much about this drug in any... Uh uh, verifiable way, and I think that uh, the studies that are beginning to open up now that uh, interest has been aroused in the uh, drug and, and this pure material is available will do a lot to uh, uh, settle the dispute as to how safe or how dangerous the drug may be. No true discussion of any universal subject would be complete without commentary from another planet. Let's welcome, direct from the moon, Orville! Thank you. How are you, Orville? Oh, I'm all right. I wasn't expecting such a warm and receptive tape cartridge. <laughs> yes, well, <laughs> we've, uh, we've asked you here to... Uh, How's the whiplash, all right? Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> We've asked you here to this uh, special program, potpourri, or potpourri, actually, sorry, to add your views to the many other ones expressed tonight on the subject of marijuana. Marijuana. You have marijuana on the moon? Oh, yeah. You do, huh? <gasps> hmm? Do you smoke it? Smoke it? No, we don't smoke on the moon. Oh, so don't you smoke anything? Just Polish hams. Mm -hmm. I see. Well, what, do you, what do you use the marijuana for then? We use it for flower arrangements. I see. Well, it's, it's a plant. I imagine Mary Jane makes a very nice centerpiece. Hmm? No, she's all thumbs. <laughs> Actually, my sister Emily is pretty good, though. Yeah. Well, if you don't smoke on the moon, do you uh, uh, turn on with anything? <laughs> hmm? yeah. What do you use? We eat chrysanthemums. <laughs> you eat chrysanthemums? That's ridiculous. <laughs> Don't knock it if you haven't tried it, buddy. Is everybody up there? Is everybody up there on chrysanthemums? <laughs> Are they? How high the moon? Would you consider that a narcotic? No, I'd consider that a song plug. <laughs> Actually, I see. <clears throat> Do you uh, ever eat anything else? Any other flowers, like rhododendrons? Only when we can't get the good stuff. <laughs> mm -hmm, I see. But you do get high on the moon. Actually, we refer to it as getting low. <laughs> I see. Mm -hmm. you, uh, you wouldn't happen to have a couple of joints of chrysanthemum on you, wouldn't you? No. <laughs> well, wait a minute. As a matter of fact, yes. 
The garden show just finished in here. We, uh... <laughs> Woo! It's a monster. All right. You don't have ones like that in the moon, huh? Mm -hmm. No, no. We have just little bitty ones. This is from the Burpee Seed Catalog. Sure you don't want to turn on? No, you go ahead. You go right ahead. Be my guest. <laughs> Whee! Freak out time, boy! Don't throw the stem away! Don't throw the stem away! That's the best part. How oh, is that all right? Wonderful! Whew. You all right? Yes. You sure? Yes. Good. Sure you don't want to turn on? No, no, thank you, no. Certainly was a weird kind of pot. No, we don't eat the pot, just the chrysanthemums. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is there a law against taking chrysanthemums up on the moon? No, it's perfectly harmless. Unless you inhale, of course. Mm. Why, is there a law against using marijuana on the earth? <laughs> I'm afraid there is, yeah. Mm. Pretty dangerous stuff, huh? Like martinis? No, it's not actually as harmful as alcohol, according to doctors, but, you know, there's a concern that if you start with marijuana, you may go on to two other things, you know. Yeah. A lot of truth in that. Adolf Hitler used to turn on symphony music, and then he went on to other things, you know. <laughs> yeah, I never thought of that. Never thought of that. We did. It influenced us a lot up there, boy. It's a felony to possess symphonic recording. Really? You get caught with Swan Lake, it's five years. Boy, oh boy. Kidding? My sister got busted for a night on Bald Mountain. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. You really think it's harmful for a kid to listen to, say, you know, Tchaikovsky? Well, one thing leads to another. Kid starts out digging the Nutcracker Suite. Next thing he wants to try, a little Rimsky Korsakoff, you know. Mm -hmm. Pretty soon he falls in with the wrong crowd. Somebody lays a little Arnie Schoenberg on him, and it's freak out time, you know. Can't he just stop listening to Arnold Schoenberg if he wants to? Mm -mm. Not cold turkey. Mm -hmm. I know, but do you think it's really, that's a fair law? I mean, punishing people for buying classical records? You think just because... Hitler started out listening to symphony music and then went on to more dangerous things. You think that means everybody who started out on, on symphony records is going to, uh... No, no. But we can't take the risk. Can't run the risk. After all, we learned that rationale from you people. You taught us that. You taught us that? Yes. I, I see our time is up. Oh, sorry. Before I go, would you... <coughs> Like me to lay a couple rhododendrons on you? <laughs> no. no, that won't be necessary, but uh, I would like to offer you something, though. Would you like to take something back to the moon with you? Something relatively harmless, like, say, a case of scotch, a couple cartons of cigarettes? <laughs> if you don't know how to smoke them, we'll be glad to teach you. No, thanks. Don't you think you people have taught us enough already? Mm, well, can't I? Can I do something for you? Well, yes. Take me to your burpee seed catalog. <laughs> Thank you and good night. Gives you a better outlook on life. Makes me happy a lot, you know. <laughs> That's how I live. I get stoned every day. I, I don't approve of it simply because I think people are taking an awful big chance with their lives. As a nurse, I feel that there's a lot more needs to be known about it before it's considered safe uh, for anyone to take. The only reason that they can't afford to make it legal right now is because 20,000 law officers will be unemployed and looking for a job. I don't think marijuana is very good. I've tried it before, but I think I can do without it. Well, I'm from Langley Park, Maryland, and a lot of my friends out there smoke it. And, well, I don't see anything wrong with it. I mean, if you're going to go get drunk on beer or something, you get rowdy and everything, but marijuana, you're peaceful and you can, you act completely straight 
And, you know, you can't tell you're high, really. You can't do anything wrong, but if a person is drunk and someone comes walking along, you know, they can tell they're drunk. I have a young daughter. I can't afford the chance of smoking marijuana. Well, incense, uh, there's, there's two things it's used for, actually. I think it came along sort of with a cultist, cultist tradition um, of sort of the mystical idea of uh, smoking pot. And then the other end of it came with actually because it covers up the smell, you see. And that's really where it's at. That's what's happening. Marijuana, I think the laws are ridiculous. And I think they encourage people to break a law. And uh, it's, it's something that should be looked into and discussed further instead of uh, uh, talking about a subject as though it's uh, totally taboo. And we should go.